Oh, huh. This guy. No, oh, man. I haven't eaten yet today. Mm -hmm. Bro, you know we go on at three. Such is life, though. So you showed up with food. So we're allowed to do this now. Allowed to do what? This is my life. Ah, no, nah, nah, it's all right. It's all right. Now I'm going to bring my food with me next time. I'm going to light it up right here. <laughs> I can tell you while I'm eating my chicken. It's my life, bro. Nah, see, this is what happened, man. People get comfortable. You know, we started, you know, we, we had ties on, we had a suit on. Now, now, we, <laughs> now you eating and everything, huh? Nah, what's good, though? Not much, man. How was your Easter? I see Hashim. Hashim! Uh, nah, man. Um, it was good. It was good. I, uh, yeah, it was good. <laughs> nah, that's it. That's it. I mean, what, what's that? Don't go into too much steps, bro. Listen, Don't go was, too far. Nah, I was thinking of what I'm gonna say, but I just I was at home. I, was, I, was, I enjoyed I enjoyed being at home. It was good. It was good. How's your Easter? It was good, bro. Yeah. Uh, nah, man. It was. Uh, I mean, obviously, how how good could it have been? Considering, you know, I. Uh, Spent it with the kids, and I went did some yard work, which I've never really done before. Yard work? Yard work, bro. When you say yard work, like, what's yard work? Like, you picked up leaves? No, right? no, I was cutting branches, trees, everything now, man. It was, oh, yeah? I was trying something different, bro. Damn, it's not cold in D.C.? Today it is, yes. Uh, over the weekend, it was like 75. Yeah. Mm -hmm. but what's it, like, what's it like in Miami? I'm guessing that's a stupid question. Uh... It's, uh, it's nice, man. You know? Oh no, no, that's that's a that's a tornado, a hurricane about to hit. What you mean? Nah, that's, Stop that's, being nah, that's fake news. That's just a little, you know, a little gray sky, but nothing. The sun will come out in a bit. All but right, uh, so what we got today, bro? What's going on? Yeah, so today, uh, what episode is this? Episode five. Hey, I come guess. on. Yeah, five. Yeah, five. Yeah, episode five. Now, we want to talk about um, the Olympics. We want to talk about um, the build-up, the build-up to, to the Olympics, uh, what a lot of people don't know, what, uh, what it took for Team GB to, mm -hmm. to be able to, to get to the Olympics. Um, also want to talk about the Olympics, the, you know, itself, uh, that experience. Um, I want to talk about just, you know, how you view the team, uh, what, you know, in terms of how did you feel about it? Um, not so much wins and losses, just how did mm -hmm. you feel about it? Also, what's, uh, we'll get to it. We'll get to it. That's a good uh, question. Make sure yeah. you answer that. We answer that one. Yeah, yeah. We'll get to it. You because see it. I know you see it. Now nah, we'll get to it because it's going to get a bit spicy today. Uh, it's, it's, it's gonna, it's gonna hurt some feelings, but it's all right. It's, uh, hey, someone said you have to pin the comment. Uh, the name may or may not be Benson. Oh, oh, shoot! All right, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Please excuse me, everyone. This is Luz. He's still a novice at this. Nah, nah, Benson ain't send it. While, while you're while you're taking your time. All right, hold on, hold on. Everyone, bear with me. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I gotta do this because these guys don't wanna. Um, get on the what is it the the live doc? <laughs> Matthew wants to talk about Finch. Yeah, we could talk about Finch. No, nah, Matthew wants to talk about Finch. <laughs> Only Matthew does. You don't want to talk about Finch? Ma no, NBA Live. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> Matthew needs to chill. <laughs> You doing it? Yeah, I'm waiting for him to. We sent it already. No, nah, he didn't. This guy. Well, he I, it, it, he, it's he quiet it. for that, then. Huh? It's quiet for that. We have to get started. No, no, no. Hold on, hold on one second. I'm going to find it. I don't know if this is Bush that I mean, but it's all about your health. All right, um, yo, you know what he told me about the pin thing? Mm hmm Yo, that pin thing don't exist, fam. I'm sorry, people. It says post. It, it, it doesn't give me no three pin thing. 
What pin thing is he talking about? Yeah, fake news. Yo, we'll do it next time, man. We'll do it next time. Let's let's focus. Let's focus on the what we gotta do. You guys All right. We're gonna start. I think we should just start from the I guess the beginning. I mean for me when I was uh when I was, well, buddy, hell, you played for GB at 12, 10, 11, 12, right? Wait, what? what? Say, say that again? I played what? You played for England when you was a, a junior. Uh, yeah, I played. I started playing for England early, I think. Yeah, when I was 12. Hold on, hold on, hold on. This is what you have to do. Whatever you want to post, you're supposed to hold it. To pin it. But it's too late for that. Okay. I said it was too late five minutes ago, but you were still trying it. But anyway, whatever. No, I told, I told Benson to send me the information, but apparently somehow uh, they did not reach, I think. <laughs> anyway, so, so, yeah. So, yeah, I played for England. I played for England early. Uh, mm -hmm. what, 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 so, let's, let's talk a little bit um, just about people don't know what it had to take to, to be part of uh, to, to, to get to the Olympics people think because we hosted that we were just allowed to play but that's not the actual what happened um, so I want you to talk a little bit about the build up you know so I think I guess usually find out uh, five, four or five years prior to the Olympics who's going to get the next bid and I think when it came out that GB or, or London 2012, the Olympics are going to be in London in 2012. We had, we had already started playing by that point. I think we had already started playing GB in 2006. I joined the team in 2007 because uh, I was with the Mavericks and I couldn't, I couldn't come during the summer, the first summer that we had the GB campaign. So I joined the team the year after. And I think from 2007 or 8 onwards, we kind of knew that the Olympics were going to be in London. But what people don't really know is that um, the Olympic Committee said just because we were the host country that, we, that the basketball team wasn't going to get an automatic bid. Now, I personally think that was um, strategic because, you know, there's basketball is a big sport next to the, um, the the athletics or the 100 meters or in track and field is probably the most watched sport, especially team sport in the whole Olympics because you got the USA team, you got the Spanish team and whatnot. So they made us qualify for our own Olympics, which was a little, we felt a little unfair, but again, we were, we were okay with it because we knew we had the talent and the ability to do so. So I think from 2007 onwards, we was trying to prove to not only ourselves, but proving to the masses as well as the Olympic, the IOC, that DB should have an Olympic team um, present during 2012. Yeah, but, um, you know, like what you said, so, so pretty much me, I felt like I wanted to be, I wanted to play in the Olympics. Um, I, I really, I looked at it as I had no other ways um, of, you know, ever playing in the Olympics. This this is it. I, I wanted to experience it. I wanted to be a part of it. And I I dedicated pretty much every summer uh, to the national team. Uh, so I also, you know, we also try to use it. I really try to use it to, to better my game. I felt like I was staying in shape for the season. Um, a lot of Chicago, a lot of people in the Bulls organization didn't like it. Um, some people liked it. Um, you know, we have some international scout that they understood, uh, you know, what it means to, to represent and, and play. So they were always encouraging. But a lot of people didn't want me to play. But I still, you know, took that chance because I wanted it so bad. I, I really felt like... Why did you it, want it so bad? It's a lot. I think I wanted to talk about... I wanted to have an experience to say I was at the Olympics. I wanted to see what it's like to be, you know, uh, at the Olympics Village, uh, at the park. I wanted to see what it's like to, to be amongst other athletes um, that are competing and they've dedicated four years just for this one month. Mm -hmm. 
I wanted to be there. And also, more than anything, I felt like the people that I grew up with, I wanted us to, to do something together. You know, it was like, I felt like British basketball can't get any higher than this. And it's kind of like our era to kind of leave a mark behind it. So a lot of, you know, commitment and effort went to it, you know. But I remember it wasn't easy for everyone because, you know, I had a contract. Uh, there's, there's one of the years that I didn't have a contract that I, you know, I was a free agent, but for me, I had a contract, but I was still committed to go and play. But there was a lot of guys, you might've been in that boat sometimes where your contract is finishing and you're playing, you're risking getting hurt. Do, do you remember the insurance issue with me? <laughs> do I, bro? That's, <laughs> um, it's funny because um, obviously <laughs> yeah, uh, we have to explain that part. Uh, but well, yeah, yes, you explain it. You explain it better. Than I me. don't know it. I don't know exactly the. I, I mean, I know it, but I don't like. Okay, so all I know was I wasn't allowed to play because insurance couldn't pay the money. Uh, no, no, no. GB no, no, no. couldn't pay the money. GB didn't want to pay. They couldn't Don't find the company to insure your contract. Now. There was a bunch of us playing in Europe, and I think at that time, for that year, I think I had just, yeah, I just came from playing in Russia, so I wasn't on the NBA contract. So nobody else's contract was too high for the, the uh, insurance company to pay. And then you come along, and they're like, well, we can't, they can't do it. So GB had to go out and find a company that would sponsor the GB team. And the one company that came, came about was standard life but they was like yes we will 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 cover the insurance only if you make us the main sponsor so yeah that's how we had standard life across and one day it was just random because um it was random because uh i was like where who is standard life and where did it come from and all of a sudden they're all over our, our uniforms our jersey our, our warm-ups and stuff so that's how um lou was even able to play in the olympics let alone uh play for gb yeah. Anyway, so so that <laughs> it's funny. I didn't even know that's the exact story. Yeah, that's the story. I just, yeah. Listen, I just knew, I just knew I had to get insured, insured somehow, because the Bulls weren't going to let me play unless the contract was insured, and GB wasn't sure that they could afford it, so we had to find uh, uh, Standard, and Standard picked it up. Mm -hmm. uh, but let's go back to so. Basically, for people that don't know, we weren't allowed to just participate in the Olympics because the team was so bad. Um, <laughs> That's what it was. <laughs> there's no other ways of saying it, bro. I, I could, I could try to just make it sound good and be like we were in what is it, uh, C level C so, or whatever you want to call yeah, it. Yeah, so the different levels, and obviously like Spain, the USA, <laughs> all these other big countries um, play in the A group. And when we started, like Luai said, we were so bad that we were the C group. So every year we have to, to win that group or that division to go up to the next level. Every so summer. We, every summer. So from 2007, I would say until about two, 2006, until about 2009 or 10, we had to continue to, uh, to play in these group challenges against some countries that barely had basketball teams too. And we fell into that boat. But we had, at the time, we could, not too many teams could boast three, four, five players who have either been drafted to the NBA, played in the NBA, or were currently NBA players. So, you know, we was running through those groups until we got, we finally got to the A level. So you can go from there. Yeah, so it took all that, it took all that work that people didn't know to actually be part of the Olympics. And it took you know, us committing and coming back and playing and, and everything else that was going on, basically uh, everyone had to handle their own situation by themselves, whether it was teams, whatever. You know, we just got together. We got a camp. We did some. We did a camp in Houston, a camp in... Uh, that, was, that was 2012, though. You, you skipping the doing right to the Olympics? No, no. I'm just talking about just the process in general. But 2012 is when we did the, uh, the camp in Houston. Yeah, it's just part of the process. Why do you have to, like, pinpoint it? Why is everything about pinpointing today? I'm not pinpointing. I'm thinking we're starting from 2010 and moving forward. I'm talking about the European Championships, all that other stuff, or you just want to go right to the Olympics? 
No, but why has it got to be Olympics? Like, I mean, Houston exactly that day. I might have went to Houston with some other guy. Oh, <laughs> you, see, you see, that's why I don't want to go to my nah, nah. You see how he well, done? You see how no, different No, but I'm he is. saying the story was flowing, but you just got to come in there. I'm, just... I'm confused. I'm trying to keep up with it, and you're already talking about I'm talk stuff. Yeah, because we're talking about the process together, like how it all happened all at once. Like, you didn't just eat, you know? Like, I'm not talking about... I washed my hands, then I dried my hands, then I... No, I washed my hands, I ate, I might have dried my hands somewhere in between. It's just the whole process, man, like the whole thing. Anyway, so, yeah, so we do, so we're doing all that. <laughs> <laughs> so we get ready. Anyway, we get ready for all that. I, I want to... Basically, so we go into some places. This is where we talked a little bit about the, the issue with racism, uh, that we've experienced in some countries, and we were going to some places we've never been before, like, yeah, or I've never, no disrespect, there's some places I've never heard of. Like, it was my first time being in Belarus. I, 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 I never, do you remember Belarus? Me too, Belarus, Sarajevo, Bosnia. Yeah, but do, yo, you remember, where, do you remember where we stayed in Bosnia? Man, uh, so, in, in, I got to, this story was insane. Um, we was in Sarajevo, Bosnia, and we get to the hotel, and the hotel, you know, if, for people who don't know, former Yugoslavia, there was the big, I guess you could say, civil war in the early 90s. And being in London, you, we heard, I used to hear about it all the time, watching the BBC and everything. Fast forward to, I think, 2010, we go, we go to Sarajevo, and the hotel we stay in still has bullet holes from the war. From the war. And I was like, well, it's not a great sign, but, you know, I give it the benefit of the doubt. And we get into the hotel. There was no hot water, electricity went out, and um, it was freezing. In the middle of the summer, it was freezing. I remember using one of my GB duffel bags as a pillow, put my hoodie over my head, my GB hoodie, and this is how I slept, just like this. And we had to spend, what, two, three days? Because we'd fly in the day or two before the game, practice the next day, stay another night, play the game, then fly the next day. And that was the longest two and a half days I'd ever, as I had, bro. I'm Maybe. not. Hey, I'm, you gotta you gotta tell the truth because I, I, I'll tell the truth if you tell the truth about uh, when you went when you went to sleep. Did you just lock the door? <laughs> no, I did the joint you told me. I, I did what you told me. So, so man, Europe. You have to be careful in Europe, especially some parts of Europe. You have to be aware of your surroundings and where you are. And I remember Lou told me this story with him. I'll let him tell him in a second. He told me this story about how people, like you have to lock your hotel room when this guy in a stupid cup. Um, you have to lock your hotel room. How is this cup stupid though? I was just talking. I wasn't even referring to you. I was just talking in general, bro. Allow it. And so um, he was like, yeah, one time a friend of his went over. Tell the story so then I can, you can preface it what I'm talking about. Okay, so there's certain places that you go to in, in Europe that you got to be careful. Obviously, you know, not thinking that GB or we would ever be in a situation like that. But stories from where guys were, you know, they would rob you in the middle of the night. Uh, they would, you know, have a deal with the hotel oh, where they would let them in your room and they would walk in. And if you woke up, you can wait. You can open your eyes and see them, but you have to act sleep because if they see you that you saw them, they'll, you know, take a different course. But they they will come in your room, rob you. Most of the time, they're looking for your passport or whatever cash they could get. What happens and if they, you're in the room? If you're in a room, you just gotta act sleep. Like if they walk in in your room and you know, and you're in the room, you just gotta act sleep. You better start snoring. You know what I mean? Like <laughs> if you don't snore, you better start snoring because. <laughs> Cause you don't want it, you don't want it to take the wrong turn. But anyway, so I've heard all these stories, and I'm hearing it from people, you know, guys that lived in Europe and experienced it. So I shared my story with these guys. Mm -hmm. So for me, when we got to Bosnia, the only thing I could think about is I was looking at the, I was looking at the receptionist like, yo, <laughs> <laughs> like, look, man, I heard, I heard about that life. Don't don't bring that my way, right? I get to my room. I locked my door, I promise you. Everything went behind that door. Everything <laughs> that was in that room was behind that door except my bed. The only thing that was left in the corner was my bed. I had to wake up in the morning. It took me like 30, 
30 minutes to just get out of my room. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, man. So, so that night, I, just like you, I slept on my duffel bag. And I think I used my roommate. Shout out to Andrew Betts. I used his, uh, his bag and we propped it up against the door so that even if somebody opened it, it would fall and we would hear it. And good luck getting through uh, a seven footer and myself, <laughs> because that's what we, was going to happen. I was going to throw. First of all, we didn't even have a mini bar, so I couldn't even throw the little, the little uh, mini bar uh, Jack Daniels bottles at somebody if they if they came in. So, um, but yeah, that's that's the experience of what playing overseas was like, especially with the national team. And like, I think that year the group was Bosnia, Macedonia, Hungary. And one more team. Oh uh, man, I don't even remember. But I gotta tell, I gotta share the story with. Uh, I, th <laughs> I think we went south of France when you got into it with the cab driver. Yo, again. Oh, see, I don't even remember this, bro. I don't I remember you, this. No, I tell you the story. We were hour and a half. Kier I wish Kieran was here. He's think, right there. Yeah, there he is. Now nah, Kieran is there. He, he yeah. knows the group. You crazy? All right, so we go to south of France. We had a friendly game, and. We decided, we asked, how far are we from Paris? And someone said, yo, we're like... Oh, yeah. <laughs> someone, someone said, we're hour and 15 away or something. So Pops decides to tell us, yo, let's go get ready. We're going to get a car. We're going to go to Paris. We're going to go out in Paris. So we all go it's and get ready. It's not the France. What are you talking huh? about? It, wasn't a, it was Orleans. We was in Orleans. Orleans. Where My brother that? used to play there. It's like... Where it's like 90 minutes away from Paris. See, this is this is what I mean again. So No, nah, Steve, allow it. No, nah, yeah, this is nice. like the Houston thing and you have to say, "Yo, we've jumped into the Olympic." Like we just No, nah, because you're telling you're telling another story about me getting into it with somebody and having all these people thinking I'm No, 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 no. You're innocent in this one. Let me just tell the story. Preface let, it with that. I'm innocent in this one. Let them let them judge who's innocent. Okay. So anyway, so Pops talks to the guy. The guy decides to, he's going to, you know, drive us to, to Paris, to, to go out in Paris. But apparently, the, the way the conversation went between Pops and the guy, it didn't end very well. My, guys, I don't know whose fault it was. This is just me telling the story. I'm not saying it was you, Pops. So anyway, so Pops comes back and is like, yo, this guy's asking for too much money. We're not, we're not going with this guy. So we go to the reception. And we asked the reception for a different cab driver. Mind you, I don't know how the conversation went with Pops. That guy was probably just, you know, one of those guys that picks on you. Just random guys. So anyway. My French is as good as my free throws. So, so <laughs> that, should, that should let you know. It didn't end well. So the guy decided to call all the cab drivers or all his boys. And they waited outside. <laughs> and they decided that they would not let us go outside the hotel. We weren't allowed to go anywhere <laughs> while we were there except to practice and the game. That's it. For the whole four days we were in Paris, we couldn't go anywhere because Pops got into it with the whole company. Not even just the driver. The whole company. <laughs> nah, man. But that's another story right there. Yeah. Oh, man. Oh what? man, yes, and that's just one of the experiences, man. I could think of. Oh, here's one of my favorite though. We were in, I think it was the same trip. So we were we're in, we're in this part of France, and I think we played the French team the day before. The next day, we were going to practice and then go to London, head to the um, Olympic Village. And I remember it was like, man, it might have been yourself, me, um, Eric, Robert. Archibald, rest in peace. Um, Kieran was there. Ogo was definitely there. And I think Justin and Mike. So we're walking and this random dude just walks up to us, which I'm not, um, which I'm surprised because we're all tall and, and black. Well, there's a couple of white guys there. I think that's what made it easier because we had a couple of white guys with us. Um, so we're walking around and... Uh, uh, Dude comes up to us and starts talking, so we're shooting the breeze and we, he's walking with us. And it's like nine, ten o'clock. And he asks uh, ask us our name. And we all tell us tell him uh our names and then it gets to the while and he tells him his name and the dude stops. And he's like, What did you say? He said, My name is Luar. Or Michael, depends on where you are. And um <laughs> the guy was like, Luar Deng? Oh no. Oh no. <laughs> Luar Deng? 
<laughs> and the dude burst out in tears. And if anybody has seen Coming to America, this was the exact <laughs> oh my God. moment <laughs> where the guy sees Simi in the in the in the bathroom and just starts bowing. Yo, I'm not. And not only was it one of the funniest things I've ever seen, but it was the, one of the coolest. I can You were there, right? It was one of the coolest <laughs> moments I've ever seen. Look at you, of, you. of someone's reaction <laughs> to another person. And I, I was dying, man. My man got to his knees and just started bowing. It was, he just started bowing. Chief, yeah. what's up? <laughs> Yo, we can now. Uh, we got so many stories. I want. Right. Um, I know. I know. It's so many. <laughs> oh, like, bro, it's so. It's so many funny stories we could share. Um, there's this one story. I'm not gonna get to it, but I thought my life was over one time at McDonald's in Europe, <laughs> just uh, arguing over fries. But well, I'll get to that. I'll get to that another day. But um, <laughs> let's talk. So what people don't understand is um, it, it really took a lot uh, to take British basketball from where it was to to get to the highest level. Um, mm -hmm. And I think at the time, you know, we were we were proud of ourselves, but a lot of people didn't know what we're doing because basketball wasn't really um, well advertised in the UK. Uh, we didn't get the respect that we thought we should. Uh, no, yo, we got to tell that story. What? <laughs> that story that Kieran, uh, that, th this one, <laughs> the Tel Aviv journey. <laughs> 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 nah, hey, Kieran, nah. Kieran that, do as I say and not as I do. Yo, this, nah, I'm not going to tell that story. <laughs> yo, you're making it seem like, nah, man. But, uh, nah, so I, I, I really want to talk about, you know, um, the commitment that it took, the, the love that we never got, because it has a lot to do with um, everything we were trying to build is for British basketball to be at a certain level. Uh, yes. We were okay with you know, going through what we're going through or dealing with that because we loved playing with each other in the same team. But we also knew how big it would be for British basketball. But, you know, um, we, you know, so we're at the peak of British basketball, the best it's ever been um, mm -hmm. in, in the history of British basketball. And we're on our way to the Olympics. Um, you know, not... Were we confident... You, you know what it is, Lou? You know what's funny? And, and, I, and I spoke about this, uh, I forget where we were, but somebody asked about how we went into games. And I was like, you know, with us being two of the only current NBA players on the team and the guys who saw ourselves as leaders, I remember, like, if something I would feed off of you and I like to think the same happened uh, in the reverse. But I think every game... I felt like if we were able to perform to a high, to our to our to our level, we felt confident that we could win or be in, be in every single game that we played. And um, it was yeah, definitely. I definitely felt confident going into every game because you know I think if if you made a play or you started out hot or I started out hot, that the other would be like okay. He's carrying the load now. Now it's time to take over or it's time to play. And I remember um, one game specifically, bloody hell. Um, I think it was in Liverpool. It was in Liverpool when we played against Bosnia. And um, this was the year that group was, was crazy. Like Macedonia had a good team. Bosnia had a good team. Uh, Hungary was good. And um, like again, this was part of our process to qualify for the Olympics. We had to show that we could not only compete, that we could play with all these other teams. And we won the group. We won. We was five and one in the group. And this game in particular was crazy because I think um, I remember Sam from Hoops Freak posted it, that between the two of us, we had 70 points and 40 rebounds. And I just remember at one point in the game, like, we were losing. It might have been with, like, a minute, 90 seconds to go. We were losing, and Lou walked by me and was like, come on, bro. And literally after that, it was over. I was like, all right, now we have to figure this out. Like, we have to make play. <laughs> we have to make. Why would I pass to you, Kieran? Kieran said I had zero assists. Why would I pass to you? This is the question. Why Why would I? Hey, you know? <laughs> Kieran, man. Kieran doesn't. Why would I pass to him? Kieran, you know? Kieran remembers. You see that everything. funny looking left handed jump shot. Kieran remembers everything. You know, I don't doubt you had zero assists, but that's not the topic here today. <laughs> 
<laughs> nah. I finish plays. I don't make them. Okay, that's it. Listen. So <laughs> this guy. So uh, yeah. So that that being said, so I'm not trying to rush the convo, but I I want to get to, you know. So now we at the Olympics. Yes. Um, obviously, everyone, you know, a lot of people, their dream is to to be part of the Olympics, and for us, it wasn't. Some people looked at it as, you know, well, UK is hosting. Uh, why wouldn't, you know, basketball be in it? But people have no idea. It took a long time for us to get to that level. Uh, now we at the Olympics, and this is the start of basically, for me, of everything going down south. Um, yes. not, just, not just with our team, but also how I felt about British basketball at the time. And I did say it's going to get a little spicy. Speak but, on it, bro. But it's gonna get it's gonna get spicy for um, for the good for the good side for the good side uh, because I feel like there's a lot of people that we should speak on their behalf that have been dealing with this side of things for a long time and my thing is so we get to the Olympics and we didn't do well but um, who's knocking? Oh, that's me, sir. Wait, you just knock in the middle. I was knocking on the table. Is that like hurry up? Like it's no, it's just I would I've just it's just what people do sometimes. Oh, okay. My yeah. bad. No, that's all right. I'll start I'll start knocking every now and then. Uh <laughs> no, nah, but uh no, so we didn't do as well as we thought we would, uh, but we were competing against the best teams in the world. And three years ago or four years before that. We'll, we would lose to those teams by like 40 or 30. So we made a stride. But <clears throat> there's a few things along the way that I didn't like. I, I, I just think that basketball was never appreciated. Um, we didn't have the pull behind us. We didn't get the credit for, you know, what we did for that program and to take it to that level. Mm -hmm. And when it came down to decision making, I felt like we were never a part of it. But also... I still, till today, the biggest, my biggest regret is I, there should have been more coaches from the inner city, people that knew how to connect with the players better uh, than people from outside. Because people didn't understand the passion behind it and how bad we wanted it. Uh, and the people that are in charge were putting people uh, in position that they necessarily didn't love. They only loved the part of, you know, the part where they're getting paid. It wasn't, it wasn't coming from the heart, like how we, for, for us, it came from the heart. We wanted it, not just for us, but we wanted it, you know, for the youth, for the program, for, you know, uplifting the whole program. I felt like we had enough talent to change the course of basketball in the UK. Oh, um, and today, you know, I feel like whether it was purposely done and it's still being purposely done, I feel like you know what you got to do uh, in order to make British basketball better, but it's almost like it's being avoided or it's always a reason for why it's not being done. And, and, and the biggest reason for it, and you could say whatever you want to say, but the biggest reason for it is the majority of kids are playing basketball are black kids. Um, and the majority of time when you go represent the UK, you know, is kids from the inner city. Um, a lot of times we were going to Manchester, um, we were going to Newcastle, and there's nothing wrong with that, but we felt that there were people that knew us better that were never part of the UK, I mean, the, the GB uh, programming. Process, ever. yeah. And they're the people British that basketball. understood us best, you know, and that's where I look back and I'm, I wish I spoke more about that. Yeah, man, that's, that's crazy you say that, man, because... Um... You know, I've been, I wouldn't say I've been conflicted. I've been troubled and, and bothered by this the whole time. And, you know, Joe passes away in 2002. And the one thing I told myself, if I ever got the opportunity or the platform to do so, it'd be to continue his legacy, which is inspiring and empowering players and people through the game. And when we got to GB, um, I re and we was going to the Olympics, I realized this is our opportunity. Not only do we have a few players in the NBA, we have, um, you know, we have players who are playing in high-level Europe and played in, in high division, major Division One programs. 
And like, this should be inspiring within itself. Just going to the Olympics should be enough. But obviously we're not content and we didn't settle for the, for just that. Like you said, three, four years prior to that, we probably would have lost to all of those teams by 30, 40 points. Now we're in a position where not only can we compete, but we can beat a lot of, the, a lot of these teams. And what, and what disappointed me was going into the Olympics, not a lot of people knew this, that basketball amongst ethnic minorities, like you just said, is the number one played sport in Great Britain in 2010 and 2011. Basketball was the number one played team sport in all of Great Britain amongst ethnic minorities. Anybody who's walked down the street in London knows that it's nothing but ethnic minorities. So that, that was, that was um, an alarming statistic. Not only was it the number one team sport amongst ethnic minorities, it was the least funded sport amongst the top 15, 20 sports in all of the UK. So that right there stood out to me and I was like, okay, going into the Olympics, we can change this. We can change this. And I remember finding out that if we did not, we were told that if we did not medal in the Olympics, we were not only not going to get more funding, we were going to lose the funding that we had already. So that's where the disappointment in the powers that be began for me, because it was a win-win for them. If we, um, if we won the medal, then they had another team in the Olympics that medaled. If we didn't, then they got to take away the fund, the, what little funding they gave to us away. And now we're back to square one. And you remember how it was the first couple of years, like some of the flights we had to take, the hotels we had to stay in, like it was a struggle. But again, we knew it was a sacrifice to get to, to where we could be. We knew what we could do. Mm -hmm. And, you know, just going in, even though they set that such a high bar, I don't know how you approached it, but me going in, I was like, all right, I guess we're just going to have to middle. That's just how, that was my mindset. That's just how I looked at things. And that's why after I got hurt, after the second game, I continued to play. Um, that it, it, I cried and got emotional after after I got hurt with my parents, talking to my parents, because I knew I couldn't help the team the way I should have. And I remember coming to the team and telling them, hey, fellas, I don't think I can play in this next game. Never in my life had I done that. Now I'm on the biggest stage in the world, playing in front of my family, where I grew up, and now all of a sudden, I'm telling my teammates I can't play. Now that's how much, that's how, that's how badly, that's how badly injured I was. But I knew there was never going to be another opportunity for this to happen. If we were to just to get to the qualifying round, I remember in 2008, cycling and rowing, those two sports broke out and did great. GB teams did great, and then all of a sudden, those were the two, two of the number ones. Um, um, the number one, uh, the number one participated sports in the UK after that that Olympics. So I was like, look, if we show how successful this GB team can be in the Olympics, then God knows what can happen. Especially if it's already one of the most popular sports without the funding. So that was my mindset coming in that we could get uh, basketball, and basketball is not like cycling or rowing. It's such an engaging sport to the point that you remember the ticketing system. If you like, you could apply for the 100 meters, but end up getting uh, a rowing ticket or a basketball ticket. So a lot of people were disappointed that they got basketball. But because it's the Olympics, they were going to come anyway. And I remember walking back to the village and people just stopping us because they saw what we had on, saying, oh, my God, we went to the game today. And I've never been to a basketball game, but it's the most fun I've ever had. That's how engaging basketball is. And we knew if pe we just got people in the stands, how much they were gonna they were gonna love the sport. But it just it further disappointed me when we wasn't able to achieve the goal that they had set for us. But also the fact that they had set such a uh, insurmountable goal, too. Yeah, I mean, you know, for me. Um... It came a time where I realized uh, everything that, you know, people from Jimmy to people, you know, Jimmy Rogers from people that you're close to used to sell you, uh, they all started to hit me. You know, I, I remember when I was younger, uh, Jimmy would not let us play for the England team. Um, and I used to wonder why. Uh, and he used to, you know, Jimmy used to say they don't care. Um, wow. And and at the time I didn't, you know, you, you you're young, you don't see it, you know, you don't see it, and 
you're so passionate about, oh, it's a trip. You're getting on a plane with other guys from other teams. You're going to other countries. You're playing. And, and you know, and that's really around when I just started to figure out that I was better than most kids uh, at my age. And I was just destroying them. So it was fun to actually go to Poland and go to, you know, Slovenia or Croatia, whatever, and, and average 40 and win. Like, it was – England team was not – heard of to do that mm -hmm. so I was going I was doing it. I was happy I was coming back and Jimmy was just I would come right back and Jimmy would throw me into practice like nothing happened you know like I I would go with the England team and they acted like man this guy's averaging 40 mm -hmm. you know he's the man so as a kid you kind of I liked it I liked the fact that yo you know but I didn't understand what it was doing you know I didn't understand that it's taking away my hunger uh you know just being praised and being among but then I would come back to Brixton and Jimmy would throw me right into the fire he he would he would get the best guy or the best defender out there just to go after me you know well he and, couldn't have had the best defender because the best defender lived in Tottenham who's that was that we we're not talking about football fam this is basketball I mean, yeah, I'm talking about basketball. Yeah, you, yeah, nah. When you talk about bricks and there's a lot of defenders, that's all we. I say, yeah, listen, that's none of them ever. Never, listen, never, that's none of them ever guarded me. From. I know that's that. All we know. That's what, what we do. In, listen, that's what we do in Brixton. As Kojo, you probably got your defensive skills from Brixton because your brother. I got, no, 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 no. I, I may have got man. my defensive skills from Big Bro, but he didn't get them from Brixton. That's yeah, the did. Shanti way. No, listen, he doesn't. He doesn't need. Listen, I know a lot of Ashantis that don't even play basketball. It can't just be away. Well, we're the two tallest Ashantis. There <laughs> no, is. Listen, he got it. He will tell you. We'll bring him on one day. He will tell you. Yeah, that. soon, soon come. Yeah, but so so yeah. So with that being said, so for me, it hit me where I was like, yo, you know what? If if this is what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna tell England what I want, and you know, put on my points. This is after the Olympics and who I want to coach and what direction they should go and all that, right? None of that happened. I, I gave my opinion. I told them what this should happen. Do you remember when I used to, I told the England team, I said, how can I have a camp? I do a camp every year in England where I don't ask, I don't ask for funding. I don't ask for anything. I do the whole camp myself because I want the kids to have the opportunity to experience what a camp is like if you were to be in the U.S., right? Mm -hmm. to, to, to get highlights tape where they get scholarships. And we've been very successful in getting a lot of kids into school, right? I asked GB, I said, yo, you, you guys need to be part of this camp, right? Not because I want money or anything, but all these kids need to be excited and to, to, to be inspired by all these you know, basketball players that have similar background as them and are representing the country that they come from, right? Not one time, not one time did I get GB to be part of it or, or to do the camp with me, you know? And that's when I knew, I was like, yo, they want me to play for them. But when it comes to helping the kids and helping the inner city kids, they weren't showing up, you know? And that's where I started to go the other direction. Until now, you know, I'm all about helping GB. You know, if they come right now, I'll sit down with them and I help them. But they have to listen in order to get better. They have to put the right people they have to reciprocate. In, in, into basketball. There's a lot of people who know the game of basketball and know how to relate to these kids are being left out. And it's only because of relationship. These guys have relationship with other people and they just point them in position because there's no pressure about basketball being great or being good. Right. So that's they a, just left out. That's great. That's a great segue. Um, a good question from Let's Drink Beer in New York. Um, he asked us, um, would you take a front office or management position in the UK? And it's funny you asked that question because about a year ago, um, my Benny reaches out to me and tells me, hey, they're, they're trying to put a board together for uh, Basketball England. And I was like, I was like, what is what? What are the stipulations? Do I have to be present? Like, can I, can I come to the meetings in the summertime? Or like, what is it? I really want to be a part of this because they need not only that somebody that's passionate, um, uh, passionate about the sport, played the sport, but is going to put their all in it too and understands it. And I put my name forward. I said, hey, I'm I'm willing to do this. I want to do this. I feel like I need and have to. It's my responsibility if the sport is going to go in the right direction. And they they sent me an email back saying I wasn't qualified. 
qualified for what? To be on the board of Basketball England. Yeah, but what's what's the qualification? What, what's needed? Obviously, it's not playing in the NBA or having a 10, 12-year career or, or being in the front office in the NBA right now. I'm, I'm not sure, but not only did it, it did you put down, me, but did you, I just laughed, huh? Did you put down that you were a Tottenham fan? I didn't, but, I mean, everybody knows that. So if that's what affected it, then respect. Yeah, but, man. Um, I, think, I think we need to talk about that. You know, <laughs> you get that job, man. Yo, yeah. Yeah. No, I'm kidding. I'm but, kidding. The, no, but that's the, that's but that's crazy, the crazy you know? thing. I couldn't fathom that, you know, I wasn't even going to speak about myself, but I was like, I thought it was a no-brainer. Like, you don't have anybody who's played the game, anybody who knows the game, and now you have somebody who not only has all of the above, but is one of a few that's played in the NBA and wants to be a part of this, and you're telling me I'm not qualified? And I almost washed my hands off the whole situation. But again, if I did that, think about everybody else that we're, we're hanging out to dry and we're forgetting about, you know? For them to tell me I wasn't qualified just shows me how things are going and why things are the way they are. If you remember, I don't know if you had gotten to London yet. You may have because um, it was right around the time I started playing. Um, London Towers used to play against the Houston Rockets, the, the best team from the Euro League and like one or two other teams, and they would have like a tournament of child, of champions at, mm -hmm. at Wembley. And mm -hmm. man, this is when the BBL was, was, was big and was like, man, I used to go to the games and everything, and there used to be a crowd, it used to be exciting. And then I leave to go to the US and I come back and it's, it's non-apparent. I'm like, what happened to the game? What happened to the culture that um, it's no longer apparent? And one of the reasons I feel like is, you know, Joe passing away didn't help. But at the same time, the basketball family and the basketball world in the UK is too siloed. Everybody is in it for themselves. Or everybody is in it. They may not be in it for the right reason. Like, I doubt that, and I'll let you get to it, I doubt that what Joe did to you 20-some um, odd years ago when he came to you and was like, you have a chance to make it. I don't. I doubt that other people communicate with, with current players the same way, or would even want to do that, or would even be allowed to. You know what I'm saying? Because yeah. the culture is so fragmented, and everybody is so separate that we can't come together and help these young kids get to the next level. There's so much talent there, but the resources and the infrastructure is not put in place. And this is England we're talking about. This isn't a third world country. This is England and the United Kingdom and Great Britain. We're talking about one of the most developed places on the planet, one of the strongest economies in the world. And you're telling me we can't have a bridge or an avenue for players to play the game and then go and, and live their dream out playing basketball. Yeah. You know, I think, I mean, if you look, if you go back um, and, you know, to your point, exactly what you're saying, if you go back to when, you know, when we were younger and, it was a few places to go play. Um, you know, like if you say London, that's, that's, that's really, that's so rude. That's, that's like the ultimate, like, no, the wood was good. I, I don't even my, know. My bad, my bad, my bad, my bad. My bad. <laughs> like, I ain't mean to, I ain't mean to break up, man. My bad. You thought, you thought you were watching Netflix or something? No, there's someone that, there's people on the other side. My bad, though. I was just... <laughs> no, but, uh, no, so, yo, this guy, man. Oh, man. No, so back, back then, back then you had, um, it's, it's, there's reasons why, honestly, the era was so good. Uh, not only us, but I really think before us also. Um, it, the era was good because, like you said, you had a few coaches, right, that knew exactly what they were doing, but it was more than basketball to them. You know, mm -hmm. when, when you talk about Jimmy, when you talk about Joe, to them it was raising a community. Um, you know, when I, when I think back of Jimmy, and I'm, I'm sure Joe was the same way, and everyone would tell you this at Brixton, Jimmy taught me way more things than he did on the court. Uh, just things that I can use in life. Um, life yeah. you know, Jimmy taught me, obviously, the game of basketball to play it a certain way, but it's the messages behind every single training that later on I used uh, in order to be successful. It's not so much about 
how many times I was uh, dribbling the ball and how many times I was shooting the ball. It was actually when I left that gym, you know, what was my discipline in terms of what did I do in order to just help at home? You know, what did I do to, to be a good friend to somebody else? What did I see that made me get up in the morning and actually be on time to work out? You know, when, when you didn't touch the line, when we were running, everyone else was punished. Those are yeah. things that at the time you might regret, but it was teaching point, you know? And when everyone else was doing it, when you're young and you're, and you're all doing it together, you don't think of it that way. You might be mad, you might be angry, but you actually leave in a basketball practice with more knowledge than you did in your whole day. You know, those two hours where you think you were just throwing a basketball, it was more of a teamwork, how to be a leader, how to be a good person, how to respect, you know, and you carried that on. And now what I see was I had guys in my team that are better than most uh, teams that we're going to play. So every day in practice, I was going against great players, like good, good players that are mm -hmm. making me better. Now in the UK, you have so many teams and so many people who can't coach that that guy in just that random team that think he's the man is not getting any better because he's playing guys that are not that good and he thinks he's the man, you know, and he's just playing the same level every day in practice while his only competition is when they play a team that's an hour away and that's one time a month maybe mm -hmm. while we're going at it every day, you know. So I think there's a there's a, there's almost a lack of understanding you know, how important it is, the people that you put in in, uh, in charge in order to, to make these players better. And, and, and also, you're talking about crime rates and all that stuff going on. You're talking about funding, right? Funding being taken away. And everything, kids not finding things to do. So what do they do? They spend their time in the street. You know, those are times that they should be indoors or practicing or crafting, just doing something. But you're taking that away thinking that basketball was what you said earlier, you know, at the age, under the age of 16 is the second most played sports in the UK. Now they get to that age and you have nothing for them. What are they going to do? You know, they got all that time in their hands. So it leads to that, you know? Yeah, man, that's, that's a great point because for me, I mean, I did, I did sports in school and whenever I would run track on the weekends, but what basketball did for me was, even though I had to travel an hour every, you know, four, five, three, four times a week to go practice, it took me off those streets. And similar to what you said about Jimmy, like Joe, he taught me long division. Like I had homework with, with Joe. And if we didn't complete our homework correctly, we wasn't going to practice. So that's where the discipline to not only respect my education came in, but my discipline towards the game came in too. There was things we were doing at under 12 to under 13s, I should say, that I haven't even done to this day throughout my career. Like, um, we did a 10-man weave. And if you messed up a 10-man weave, you're going to have to start again. Everybody's going to start all over. And don't be the guy that messes up. Bro, like, that's, we, we don't even do three-man weave over here. <laughs> right bro, that, I swear to God, I'm not even lying. That reminds me of... <laughs> I know this. I know this. Everyone in Brixton is going to know this, but it's two places we did this. Do you remember... What do we used to call it? You used to throw the ball on the backboard and the next person... Tap it. You got to tap it, yeah. You got to tap it. The tap drill, yeah. Yeah, in BTG, Jimmy used to make us... I, I, this is no lie. We used to run outside. You tap it on the backboard. You ran outside the gym around the tree and you came back before it hits the... This is no lie, bro. And we did, we did that like every other day. We ran outside. 51, that's it. <laughs> yeah. Fabio and Justin just said it. 51, bro. I'm telling you, I've never seen it anywhere else. When I'm telling you, it'll be like 10, maybe 15 guys, uh, boys and girls. We, we used to practice together, right? I promise you. And you had to be creative. Like, sometimes you had to, like, you jump. have to throw it high off and the back it as hard as you can because you know the next guy behind you. So, yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? Like, the stuff like that, man, and it's teamwork. And if one person dropped it, everyone came back and we we redid the whole thing and nothing mattered even if we had an hour and a half of, of the gym uh available uh -huh. we did it for an hour <laughs> nothing else mattered it wasn't about jump shots it was jimmy had it in his mind i'm gonna make them believe that they could get this done no matter what i don't care how many times they fail. Huh? 
It didn't matter. Like some days we came, we came on a Wednesday or Friday, and all we did was throw the ball on the backboard. <laughs> Yo, that, that, that creates like something that, in man. you, though. That uh -huh. creates that would create something in you where that's why I love team sports so much because people don't understand that it's just bigger than playing a game. Like it creates your social skills. It allows you to become a leader, man. It allows you to be professional. It also allows you to be accountable, too. Because, um, like I said, that 10 man weave drill, where if you're the person that messes up, everybody starts again. Yeah. So then it's, it's part of a, you're part of a machine and I'm part of an engine. If you if if that little piece of the engine doesn't doesn't function, then all of a sudden it, it messes up. Yeah. And I remember Joe, we used to have to do push ups, and I think that's why during my career, some of the best seasons I had, I would just do push ups at night to just to just get stronger. And I remember if Joe just started counting, he would just be like 15, 16, 17, 18. And at first you'd be like, what? oh, he's counting, which means we have to do that many push-ups. So he would just keep counting until we, we as a team, we realized we messed up and had to do push-ups. And then some, some days he'd be like, just do your age. So I'd have to do 12, 13 push-ups just right there. I'd never done a push-up before I came to Joe's practice. I didn't even know what they were. Yeah. And so... Um, yeah, man, it was it was brutal, but at the same time, it prepared me. Shout out to Gary, Gary Maitland. Um, it prepared me for when I came to the U.S. That stuff was that that stuff was was minor compared to some of the stuff we had to do. You know what I'm saying? I remember he used to make us stand against the wall and 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 do a wall sit. But then, <laughs> hey, from now on, Kieran isn't allowed to do the, the face the, the the live with us. He can't do it no more. He gotta go. Kieran gotta go. He's a troll. And we had to we had to do a wall sit and had to keep our hands up against the wall. And Joe would come around and push our hands down. And if you fail, everybody had to start again. Yeah. Yeah, man. It was it was uh, man. It was tough. But again, it built you build that discipline and that 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 toughness and chemistry between your teammates and your and everybody else that was there. Yeah. Yeah. Nah, that's true, man. So you know the other thing too that we need to talk about is you see the time, bro. Huh? You see the time. Yes, it's two. What? I thought we big time. We get the extra thing now. B, does he get an extra? Um, we don't get the. We don't get the extended. Yo, pops, come on, bro. You don't tell me. Tell Benson. Why are you telling me, bro? Why are you telling GM. me, pops? You're I don't want. Yeah, but I'm not. Um, I'm not a GM of, of Instagram. <laughs> What's that got to do with me? Where's Benson? <laughs> Are we? Are we? The, the, I thought we the, put some time enough to get extra some extra time. All right, look, this is what we're gonna do then. We're gonna get off. No, no, we gotta be. Yeah, no, because is he gonna be able to save it, Benson? If if he gets cut off. What you mean? I know he hasn't saved now one yet, so I don't know. I've sent them to you. That doesn't mean, but it goes away after one day. What you mean? So save it, it before it goes away. Okay, Benny said we have to log out and log back in, bro. All right, so look, we'll be back in uh, three minutes. Why? Why just Why? not log in the log back on? I gotta go to the toilet, man. I've been sitting here for a straight hour drinking my tea. <laughs> <laughs> so, all right, all right, all right, great. All right, yeah, we'll be right back. So, three minutes, minutes, three minutes, bro. I'm ready. I'm not going not, anywhere. Not, not Ghanaian three minutes, like actual three minutes. Like, not, not go, like, do your whole laundry and come back late like, now. Nah, three minutes, bro. If I could swing through this phone. See, see that? You almost took me back to, to, to the road. Hey, it's cutting off, pups. All right, <laughs> yo. The phone only works if I'm on. If I'm on with you, bro. What that kind of? What kind that of should tell that? you something, man. What hmm? kind of voodoo is that, bro? I mean, Justin telling me unmute the thing, bro. I don't know, man. It only works when 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 I'm online too. So either. Wait, yours yours too? No, no, no. My my phone works regardless. I have a new phone. I don't know what you have going on over there, though. No, it's a new phone. No, it's a new phone. It's newer than yours. I saw your phone. I'm gonna tell you like this. I remember we was I was in Lagos one time and a guy tried to sell me windshield wipers and I was in the back of a I was in the back of the car. Um it sounds like from what I'm seeing, that's exactly where you got your phone from too. From where I never been to Lagos. All right, well well the way the way the way the way you're operating now moves is it, you're moving that way that's what i'm saying no i think my phone's just protecting me because you're gonna say something stupid 
No, because it knows like it's an awkward moment. I'm online and I'm live doing this live thing. This and, man played in front supposed, of me. You were supposed what? to be three minutes. You were supposed to be three minutes. And, and we talked about it. Bro, you took seven minutes. How, what? It was seven First minutes. First of all, we couldn't hear you. And then I was on it. And it always takes you three Bruh, minutes to add it. They couldn't. You just had a split second. I could see your name. I was looking for your name. You know, like, listen. It pops up, you know, like, yo, so-and-so wants to, like, join in. It's, man, it's different, man. It's different. Nah, you know, like, it's not my... I'm going to figure it out, but something is up, man. You probably <laughs> won't. By the time you figure it out... Okay, look. Where's the mute, but where's the mute button, though? And when you're alive? Anyway, anyway, no, we're taking too much time. You're taking too long, man. There's people That's online it. waiting for it. Sorry. I keep forgetting there's people watching. Um, <laughs> What's it called? Uh, so where were we? We were stuck on um, our displeasure with the powers that be. Um, this is my thing. This is my thing. Not, not to cut you off, but this is my thing, right? We all want British basketball to do well, right? Oh, God. Well, I just got a work email. Huh? I just got a work email. What you want? Bro, I don't know. I don't know what happened, bro. First, you're drinking loud, and now you just ignored. you checking your emails. No, I, I mean I'm still I'm some I still have to work. So we have to listen. We gotta apologize for the for the people that came online. I apologize for that stupid mug. That's what I'm apologizing for. Why would you apologize for my mug? It's my it's, mug. It's because it's stupid. Where's your mug? Huh? Exactly. You're That's the only I'm... mug here, bro. You're the only mug here. <laughs> That's what I'm for. You don't even have one. <laughs> but listen, listen. I uh, my whole thing is we want we want um. British basketball to get better. Um, don't even want anything from it, but I really want to give opinions on what direction it should be taken. Um, you know, it's it's frustrating when you have France is doing so well, other European countries are doing so well, now Canada is doing so well, and all of them are voicing opinion of former players or people who came through the ranks or came through the same background. So I think there's a lot of people that we should be vouching for that should be involved with GB basketball because I know their heart will be in the right place. And there's people that are doing it every day, uh, but they're not being given the resources and the opportunities to do it. So I kind of want us to push on that. And, you know, um, that's just my thing with GB. Uh, I think for me, obviously I'm not playing anymore, but I would do, you know, my part in making sure that you know, we keep encouraging these kids, but also help them, you know, put things like, for example, I'm not going to say any name, but I'll go back, I'll go back to England and there's certain places where kids have to pay almost 25 pounds to, to use the court for an hour. Where, how is that possible? You know, 25 pounds to use half court. And then, mm -hmm. and then, and then on the other half, no disrespect, you got two rich guys playing badminton. I'm going to tell you like this. Whenever someone says no disrespect, get ready to be disrespected. No, no, no. I really, I, I really, no, no. In I'm this, just saying, this, I don't, in this situation, says, I don't mean to be rude. No, no, no. In this situation, I don't mean. I'm with no, it, though. I'm, I'm with you. No, but this one, I, no, this one, I don't really mean no disrespect in terms of who they are as people, you know, but, but <laughs> this guy. That's probably what happened when, remember, from time when we were sneaking into, into um, the wreck. We, we this has been going on for years even to what's up uh adonis even even to the point where we're at the height you got nba players we're going to the olympics and there's still nothing in place for these players which is why i feel like this conversation is just bigger than basketball it's bigger than just you and i this conversation isn't for us it's like us playing basketball i i like to think not only were you playing for your family and everybody else but you were playing for a bigger goal I feel like I was playing for um, to inspire, like I said, and empower a younger generation. Now, if we're not assisted in that, I feel like we have the platform and the ability to just do it regardless. I know you. I know we need others to to be on board or some um, some powers that be to help out. But then at the same time, you just went ahead and did your camp by yourself. Mm -hmm. You just went ahead and did it, and you're doing it, and it's the best camp in England. One of the, probably the one of the best in Europe because they bring the top 50 guys who are all getting ranked, all getting exposure. All of a sudden, a bunch of them are getting a chance to play um, at the next level. So now you're providing a resource and providing um, uh, an avenue for these players to achieve and to, to blossom. 
Mm -hmm. But imagine what could happen if we had, if we had um, the backing. Again, we can't really wait and can't really be bothered with what they're doing. Yes, we have to bring it to light that people um, are not are taking. I, I don't even want to call it taking advantage. Um, they're they're just not giving the, the, everybody an opportunity. Think about where British basketball could be if from the last 10, 15 years, they had poured into these players and poured into the, um, the community. And especially, like you said, basketball is a predominantly black sport. So we're, we're, we're victim to this, the decisions that are made by people who don't look or think or have, or have the similar experience to us. And again, which is why when you get to a certain level <laughs> regarding yourself or even, or even me, you just take it upon yourself to do something. And I think with your camp and with who you are and with some of the things that I've been able to achieve too, we can just go ahead and do it. Like the reason why we just started doing this, we started doing this because we have to speak about what is going on and speak about yeah. our lives and how we got to where we were because we feel like it could benefit somebody. Yes. Now we have to figure out a way to put some of these actions to plan so that these plans to action, I should say, and give these kids more opportunities so that in five, 10 years, Luau Deng is not the last British player in the NBA. Yeah, exactly. Not, 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 not to change the subject, but I see uh, Benny, Benny is out here having one-on-one -on -one personal conversation, heading to your office. What, what, are we, Benny, yeah, what are you using, Benny's using our platform for, just text her. Yeah, like what? What is that? She said heading That's to your Bush. office. Okay, he is Bush. Have a safe Bush. travel. Have a safe travel, Benny. Hope you get there safe today. You better office. not be on public transportation because I know you can't drive. <laughs> Yo, so now, nah, but you know, my my thing also, honestly, it, it's you know, you're pointing it out there. I'm pointing it out there. GB, honestly. Oh wait, respect, Ladia J. I appreciate that, Benny. Hurry up and get to his office. You didn't, see, you didn't see what Benny wrote, but <laughs> continue. Oh, yes, yes, definitely. <laughs> yes, yo. Uh, yeah, ben, hey, make sure, let's send the driver to get you there. Yeah, 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 yeah. Is that, that the, I share are, the you, Uber. are you allowed to use Uber in London yeah, anymore? Yeah, no, nah, let's, share, let's share the Uber with Benny. Benny, just send Dr. it. Dr. Ofori is coming to pick you up right now. Get the Lux. Get the My Lux. driver, Dr. Ofori is his name. He will come pick you up right now. The SUV with one seat. No, 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 no. Sure. It has to be an Uber pool. We're not uh, Uber pool. No, no. The SUV with one seat, bro. Let let Benny just enjoy the ride. Just what kind of SUV has got? Uh, it's getting funded, man. But, Respect. Where were you? Nah, so I was just saying for GB, honestly, uh, for basketball to get better in the UK, Pops, myself, uh, don't want anything. Just want advice. Advice. There's a lot of people that are doing a lot of good things in basketball, and I think they deserve to be the people that are running these programs, you know, and I'm not talking about, it has to be people that we just friends with it, just people that we know they've been doing it for years and mm -hmm. they put in a lot of resources and their programs are successful with the little, little limited resources that they have. So GB, you know, I know somebody that works for GB is in this chat, you know, we're not, we're not going to say any names, but I know you, you are this, you know, just pass the word. Um, Anyway, so I think we should take some questions. Is, is, am I doing the thing again? Yes, you are. Yo, wait. All right, hold on. We have no questions. Nobody's put the... Oh, gosh, I have to make this disclaimer again. Um, you have to put your questions into the little question mark right here so that, so that you don't make it confusing for a while. It's not I've got some questions, though. Go ahead. So, um, how do we say this? A.A. Manilom. At A.A. Manilom asks, advice on picking an NBA agent. Huh? Advice on picking an NBA agent. That's a tough one, man. I, I, uh... Well, just tell them your process and what you did because um... I, I think I think I looked at it differently. Everyone is in a different boat. Um, I think you you have to be honest with yourself in terms of where you see yourself. Uh, first thing is be honest with you know uh, what you have available and what how you see yourself as a player. For me, I always 
I like I like having a good relationship with people. I think you know, be getting to know someone beyond just what they do is important for me. So mm -hmm. I would advise you know, ask about the people that you're interviewing or people that you're thinking about interviewing. Ask about who they who did they represent, what the relationship was like, if they had any things shady that they did in the past, and also. When it comes to the business side of it, to see their body of work, what have they done? Who was a similar player that was in your position and how far did they get them? What opportunities did they get them? Uh, but more than anything, I think picking an agent should be, you know, something you feel comfortable with. I can't just suggest go get this guy and it doesn't work out or, you know, go with her. It doesn't work out. Pick someone that, you know, you feel comfortable with. Uh, that's my advice. Yeah, that's dope. I mean, for me, I needed somebody that was going to be honest, transparent, and has integrity. You know, I think being in the player representation side of things, it's a dirty game. And it's one where I feel people um, don't really understand that all that goes into it. And you really want, um, ooh, great, great one. You really want to um, have somebody that you know is going to be working in your best interest. And um, for me, that's what it was. When I said I didn't need a big time agent, I didn't need somebody that had all you know all these clients. I just needed somebody that was going to work for me and put me in a position where my game could do the talking. So, which is why it's pretty much how I went about my whole career. If I'm in position on the court, it doesn't it does not um, matter to me. I just got a great question of a story. Okay, uh, a story about the day before we played the USA thing. You remember this? Huh? Say that again? The day before we played the USA team. Yeah. So the day before we played the USA team, this is such a great story. Where and, it's, and, and not only is it a great story, it speaks to the epitome of basketball in the UK. So day before the USA game, and mind you, I mean, before Nando's came to the US, I only really got a chance to eat Nando's when we played for GB. And... Trust me, I probably ate a year's worth of Nando's during that time with GB. And we were playing the USA team the next, uh, uh, I guess, on a Thursday. The night before, we all get together, get half the team, and we're walking to Nando's as we normally do. And as we're walking, I see this guy standing on a light post just sitting there with his leg up. And the only reason why I stood out is because he – he wasn't an average, he wasn't your average size guy. He was like, he has some size. And I, as we're getting closer, I start to recognize him. And I tap Lou. And I'm like, yo, is that who I think it is? And as we get closer, it's Kobe Bryant. Yeah. It's Kobe Bryant sitting on the, on, the, on the light pole and just kicking it. You see security about 15, 20 feet away. And his trainer, Tim Grover, was there too. And we go up to him and like, yo, what, what are you doing? Why are you just standing here? He was like... You have to understand, there's probably nowhere else on the planet where I can just stand out here in the open and nobody say anything or bother him. Yeah. And I was, just, I, was, I was literally like shocked that he was able to do that, but also saddened that all these people are walking past one of the greatest places to ever play the game, standing on the corner outside Nando's, and they're just like, they just think he's another 12 brother. And again, it spoke, it spoke volumes to the culture in the UK. And I know there was a time where everybody knew every basketball player and all this other stuff, and he wouldn't have been able to do that. But now we're in a, in a day and age where that's apparent. And that definitely has to change. Like, it's funny. Let's, let's speak about when, um, when, when we used to, before the Olympics, oh, great story. <laughs> before the Olympics, so because, as you can see, now that I'm talking to the loud, my accent comes out. But normally, you know, I lost my accent when I was 18. So, and I left London at the age of 16, where um, whenever we would come back, I, haven't, I never got a chance to experience London as an adult. I never school. lost my accent, by the way. I just choose nobody not Nobody can to tell where your accent's from, bro. I just choose not to South use London? It. South London? I don't even want to go there in regards to how you speak. And I just, how you no, I just so choose. I'm not even going to do that, huh? No, no, I just choose not to use it. But go ahead. No, no, continue. Cause from brother. So any, so yeah. So we were. So whenever we would go out or try to go out, um, we would always have trouble because the bouncers would look at us and 
be like, just, you men's are not from here. We're not just going to let you in. I'm not going to say what club we were going to, but men's, oh, we got a couple of stories. I've uh, never even been to a club. I don't even know what you're talking about. Go ahead, go ahead. Why are you yeah, tapping? So we went, Why are you so, tapping? It's like, it's anytime, so, hey, anytime Lou starts yeah. with the BS, I'll start tapping my pen. So, yeah, even, go ahead. I'm not going to say what club we went to, but as we get up, I'm like, man, Lou, what are we going to say? Because they always used to give us problems, whether we was going to just hang out or, you know, have a bunch of us and have a good time. Um, they would always give us problems at the door. So we're trying to figure out, um, we're trying to figure out how we're going to get in. As we walk up, the bouncer just lifts up the rope and is like, good to see you guys again. I like, <laughs> remember, I remember this. I was like, again? I was like, I ain't never been to this club. What's he talking about, Lou? And as we walk by him, the uh, the bouncer taps the other bouncer and is like, that's Yaya Toure. <laughs> and, yeah, and Luau, I remember that. And Lua looks at me and I'm like, just keep walking, bro. Just keep walking. They, they escorted us all the way to the VIP section. And we don't, yeah, you do. You do. And How so, you know I was looking at that? Yeah, I know what you're looking at because it was in, it was in capital letters. Uh, and know, they escorted us all the way with them thinking I'm Yaya Toure. This is why this story is funny. So fast forward a few years later, I'm in London for the the NBA Europe game. And I meet Yaya Toure's manager. And I'm like, man, I'm a big fan. Blah, blah, blah. He was like, oh, he likes basketball too. You should come to a game. So we take the train all the way up to Manchester and, um, and go to watch the game. And mind you, I've gotten the Yaya Toure... Um, I've gotten a Yaya Toure comparison or, or, or question before, but that just, I think it's just because he's tall and dark. No, 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 that's not, that's not right. Oh, it's because I'm a good midfielder. Is that what you no, think it is? That's no. You, you, you look like Yaya Toure. Nah, bro. Bro. <laughs> <laughs> bro, I'm telling you. So, okay. So to that point, so we go to the game and I'm sitting, I guess, where his seats are. And this lady looks and does a double take. I'm like, I didn't think nothing of it. Come to find out it's his wife. <laughs> yeah, and she thought you were Yaya. His wife, who was like, what? And then looks on the field and it's like, man, I thought you were him. But then when we stand next to each other, we don't really favor each other, but I see why people were saying it. It was just funny that, um, <laughs> it's funny that people were saying that I got it. And after that, I would just get it all the time when people were thinking I was Yaya Toure. But from now on, if you see me in a club in London, you know it's Yaya Toure. Yeah, 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 Tore. Yeah, 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 Tore, Tore. <laughs> yeah, that's a great story, man. I had some questions. Hold on. You got to give me time because I got to use this thing to scroll up. Mm -hmm. There was. Uh, Why are you looking? Um, yeah, man. Sad day. Um, just found out Car Anthony Towns' mom passed away. Uh, oh, man. Nah. Good kid, man. She died from COVID 19, which is sad, man. It's a uh, good kid. His mom was so cool, always supportive and around him, man. It's tough to see and hear that, man. Hopefully, he's in um, good spirits. If you guys get a chance, go to his page, you know, send your condolences, send your love, man. It's, uh, that's um, scary, especially, you know, for all of us who have um, older parents or just um, people who are everybody who is at risk and everybody who is um, exposed to this. You know, we, this is the whole reason why we're here. So sad that this happened, but let's let's continue to, to keep him in our prayers. Man, that's, that's tough, man. I played I played with Towns. I know how close he is to to his mom. This, mom this is a, yeah. that's, that's a tough one, man. Rest in yeah, peace. Yeah, that's a for sure. We got to reach out to him. This is... Nah, that one hit me, bro. Um, yeah, that's just tough. That's tough. Yeah. Mm -hmm. well, what were you looking for? What question were you looking for? Um, let me just check. Um, oh, but while you're checking, you want to talk about the, the, the USA game? Seeing as we spoke about the Kobe part? You know the honest truth? I don't remember anything about the USA game except Neither. us. You know what's funny? Except, the only us thing I remember lose, was, except us losing. Oh, yeah. At least we didn't lose by 80. I know Ni Nigeria. Bro, Shout out bro, to Nigeria. Lost. We, lost, we, lost, we lost by a lot, bro. We lost, we lost by a lot, obviously. And being competitors, you don't want to lose. But we competed until for, for a good while. And I remember, I, I, pro I don't know how much what I ended up with, but I had probably one of the best first halves of a game that I've had in a while. And at half, I remember calling my brother Cole 
and was like, and at, before the game, and him just going, yes, yes, <laughs> yes. And I'm like, what are you saying yes for? Like, what? And he was like, man, he really wanted to speak to me before the game and make sure I had my mind right. But I was so focused, I almost forgot. So I called him, and, you know, we speak about the game, and I, I come out, we come out just hooping. And I'm thinking, man, I'm about to get another NBA contract. I'm about to kill it. I think I scored one point and two rebounds in the second half, and they uh, started double teaming. What would you not do to what? What, what would you not do? Basically, I think it's what would you do to build British basketball? Um, and, you know, what wouldn't you do or what would you do? Good question. I wouldn't do what they're doing right now. I know that. Um, I would say we build it from the ground up. That's how you're supposed to do it. You start from the foundation. I was reading uh, Alex Ferguson's book about leadership and his approach to Manchester United. A lot of people don't know when he got there, he, like, he hadn't really done much. So when he gets there, he tells the board and tells everybody, hey, you have to, um, you have to, you have to build from, from within and build from a young age. And that's how we started with like Beckham and all these other guys. He, he empowered them at a young age so that when they got older, they were successful and they had, um, they had, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? They had, um, they had some sort of um, tie to the team because he invested in them at a young age. And that's what we have to do in regards to British basketball. You build it from the foundation, from the grassroots level, and then continue to provide the resources and provide the infrastructure. Then when those guys get of age, they can also reciprocate and they can also, you know, be successful. And you be like, okay, we see how this works. And then it's an ongoing cycle. That's what was, I felt like that's what was going with us. We joined programs like Brixton and Hackney where players had come before us and they, you know, they were successful. So they had the blueprint on how to help the younger generation. If you, ju you can't just start off by trying to invest money in the BBL, which I think is needed and it's great, but you have to start from the ground. You have to start from the basics. You have to start from the fundamentals and we have to invest in it. And investing in it is going to take more than just the funding. It's not, don't get me wrong. The funding is a start and it's key, but you have to have the right people in place too. Yeah, no, I definitely agree with, with you on that. I think I think it's important to, whenever you're trying to make anything better, to look at what is the strength and what is the weaknesses. And I think that, you know, our strength, you got to go back to what we, you and I talk about a lot that mm -hmm. made us think differently or made us really come around the sport more than just the game. I, I think you got to, you know, take mentoring. You can't just pick guys that, think they know the game or you know telling guys you know shoot like this or like that it's it's more than that it's it's mentoring so you gotta you know figure out who those guys are those guys that are actually spending time with kids just making them better you know human beings uh taking them out of the streets and you know kids are struggling with a lot mm -hmm. and making it more than just the game it's, it's not just about showing up where you have no idea what's going on in the kid's life. You're just showing up at 8 to 10 or 6 to, to 9, just telling the kids to run line and shoot jump shots. That might work in other parts of England or, you know, other parts of the UK because those kids have a better situation when they leave their gym. Mm -hmm. You know, so picking, picking people to lead those kids or coach those kids is really important in terms of how you're relating those kids to, you know, the kids that are coaching. You're not just picking them just because you want to give them a job or just because you know them. So depending on what area uh, and, and also locating, locating those programs that need help, you know, it can be as a coach in the inner city, I'm charging kids, you know, two, three pounds for an hour because I'm trying to go home and feed my family, you know, like how, how That's can what Kieran you, just said, yeah. Yeah. How can you come in and fund these programs where as a coach, I can just be a coach where I'm getting taken care of and I'm not charging the kids. The kids can show up and be here. So, you know, it's something that it, it has to be taken seriously because it's being ignored and people are just figuring out way, you know, like when I go back to England, uh, when when I was playing in Brixton, it was hard for me to get one pound to practice. You know, people right. people might not think that way because they don't know what it's like. But you know, it's different now, obviously, because the game gave me so much. And but when I think back, there's there's days where 
I might have got that one pound or two pounds last minute. And I was 30 minutes late to practice, and I still paid two pounds for uh, an hour and a half, and I lost, a, you know, an hour already. You know, so it's, it's, th there's ways of really fixing GV basketball. And if you're really about it and you want to fix it, you know, you got to listen to the truth, not just, you know, come in and think you're just going to change the program by, you know, um, recruiting more kids and just not even, you know, thinking about what, how are they practicing? What, what are those kids like? Not, not waiting for them to be good, then you just take them. That's not going to work. Um, yeah, man, that's, 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 that's crazy, man. I know. And again, for, for, for me, who didn't really love the sport initially, I just knew it was the sport that my brother played and the sport that I had just learned, uh, you know, traveling, I had to travel. I told you I had to travel an hour to Hackney to go play. And luckily Joe was a school teacher at, at the school he taught at. We didn't have to pay for the, for the court. Otherwise, you know, I would never have been able to do it. I was going to have to ask my parents for more money to um, to do that. And, um, you know, it speaks volumes to the culture and everything that's in place. Like, we can't, especially the kids that are going to play, we can't afford that. A pound, a pound even back then, and compared to now, still goes a long way. Yeah, and, exactly. You know, like, the, the fact that you ask a kid to pay a pound every day, you're supposed to train three, four times a week. You think I'm going to come up with four or five pounds? No way. There's no way I'm gonna be able to do it, and 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 again, that on top of the travel, y'all would have never heard of me. I would have, you know, been the next door on Grant jumping high jump instead. But um, you know, it's it's that's the, I think that's the part that has to change. We really have to put a system in place because just looking at how great how the system is here with high school basketball then in the u.s and you go to college and then obviously so on and so forth but it starts from aau it starts from from um sports in the school and you know if we don't put those in place then it's just going to be an ongoing cycle we're going to have the same conversation five ten years from now so i think you know the time is always now to change something to change that but um very true man benny uh, yeah, go ahead I want to put up, uh, there's a questions here about our work ethic. I think we covered that, but we could talk about it quickly. Uh, yes. And then I'll jump back to GB. So here is the question. I don't know if you could see all of it, but it just says, um, what did your work uh, uh, regiments look like on a daily or yearly basis when you guys were growing up? This is from Baf uh, Bafo Joseph. Shout out to Bafo Joseph. So, Pops, I, I know we talked a little bit about it. Uh, what did Matthew say? Yeah, <laughs> yo, man, the, the struggle is real, man. Listen, the struggle. Look, look nah, right here. Yeah, yeah right here. I can't I'm see. You, I can't see. I tell you, I tell you why. Listen, when the question, when the question is a lot, right? It's like it's so small, bro. Like I can't see. I have to like focus in. But anyway, anyway, this is Matthew. Whatever, man. Um, yeah, I think we did answer this question, but for the people who weren't here last time. You know, I think, you know, I'll give you an example of what she I used to do. She never finishes, by the way. My team never finishes. Now, go ahead. Go ahead. Don't worry. What? Did someone ask uh, if this is an Arsenal? Uh, yes, it's Arsenal. Yeah. Uh, go ahead. I'm going to keep my, I'm gonna keep my uh, comments to myself. So, for me, uh, I'm going to speak to the time of when I was in the best shape of my life. After my, anybody who remembers the story about Russia and everything, after that experience, I was just, I didn't take no time off. I was angry. I was determined. I was motivated to, to just have the best summer I could have so that I could go into my next season ready and be able to perform going into the Olympics. So uh, that summer, I would wake up at uh, 5, 6 o'clock in the morning, I would, um, you know, shout out to my guy, J.R. Holden. You know, I learned a lot a lot of that for him. He was a teammate of mine in Russia. I'd wake up at 5 or 6 o'clock in the morning and go, um, where would I? I would go to hot Pilates. I would do hot Pilates, and then I'd go lift. After lifting, I would go, I would drive like 30, 40 minutes to go do some drills. I would drill, and then I would play pickup. And so that was my day. And then the days I didn't do hot Pilates, I would do, uh, strength and conditioning with a boxing trainer. So I wasn't actually throwing punches for all of you who's going to come up with the, with a smart response. What were um, you doing? What were you doing? I think that's all what the people would... No, people would All ask. the conditioning drills. 
Con boxing conditioning drills. Or oh, boxing conditioning drills. So, so you, you I was held, never punching you, an actual person, I should say, huh? So you held your hands down while you did, like, the footwork? Like, how did you do, like, the... I don't even know what it's called in boxing, but how did you do the footwork with your... Like, what What did you do? Okay, so let me preface it with this. I wasn't I wasn't sparring or fighting anybody. I did, I, re I, I really even wore gloves. So but I'm saying, but you said you didn't throw punches at all. I wasn't throwing punches. So we would do one example was I would uh, I did throw punches. I just didn't throw punches at people. Oh, and so, so you weren't punching anyone? You mean I wasn't you, punching you, anyone? Yo, this guy. <laughs> I wasn't punching anyone. So I'll give you an example. So we would do we would punch the heavy bag for fifty punches. One to one to fifty. Then I'd get right onto the uh, treadmill and sprint for sixty seconds. I'd get off and then punch the pads for fifty. Then I'd do it again, and that was one. And we would do that eight times. And you wonder why you're trying to fight everyone? You no, just... I wonder why I was in good shape. That's all it was. No, no, it's definitely great shape. Now nah, boxing is hard, man. Man, it's, it's a newfound respect. One of the hardest things I've ever done. Nah, boxing is no joke, bro. Right. So that was my regimen, and that's what I did the year that I felt like I was in the best shape of my life. Yeah. You know, I think, I think for me, uh, I always tell people this. Um, um, I, like to I like to think of myself as a thinker. I know, Pops, you might not agree, but I like to think things through. Like, seriously, I like to. So I was always honest with myself. Um, even when I was working hard, if I met someone who inspires me in some way or I could learn something from, and I don't care what people say, I always took that and added it. So, you know, I was talking to Matthew Ryder earlier, one of my good friends, and we spoke again about LeBron, and I said, yo, there's so much that I learned from what I saw, you know, him do or seeing other great players do, and I always add it. Like, you have to be in order to keep moving forward, honestly, you have to be so honest with yourself and seeing your weaknesses and not getting carried away with all the praises that you're going to keep on hearing. You know, that's just the way life is. People will always tell you how great you are, but only a few people will really tell you what you need to do, right? But you have to be, as a person, honest with yourself. Yo, I'm not very good at this and I need it. You know, and you and you and you have to keep on pushing to just keep on motivating yourself to get better. If you just think of yourself as you got it all or you figured it out, right? Which is crazy when I say it because some people are like, "Yo, this makes sense," but there's some people who still think of themselves that they know it all. Even with me saying this, they still think they know it all. No, seriously, and you don't really realize it that you might not be that way or you might be that way, but there's so much that you know you some people can't improve themselves they get to a certain level and they just stay still you know whether it's motivation or satisfaction but uh -huh. the majority of it is because they're not honest with themselves you know what i mean and i think for me i just kept going i, I really didn't want it to ever settle in even from the get-go where i came from i never wanted it to be oh i'm here that's it i gotta chill you know i don't see any chill anytime soon i just see just keep on going no matter what it is you're approaching no matter what it is right now you just got to keep going you just got to keep on going and that's how you keep you know getting better and keeping that level you know that's that's for me no that's true man i always i learned from you know a few people that i used to work with and for was that if i'm the smartest person in the room then i'm in the wrong room exactly. you know what i'm saying yep. so you know you can always continue to learn you can always get learn from other people and, and get smarter as you go along because people um, all have different experiences and every person that I interact with, I always try to learn something from them or gain something from that conversation. It's like you said, you don't go into the gym to just shoot around. You go into the gym so that when you left, you left better than you were prior to. And that's just like this quarantine. We're all coming in here doing whatever and you know everybody feels like the world is over. But when we, once we get back to our regular lives, you're going to look yourself in the mirror and be like, you know what? This time I was able to reflect. I got better. I learned a new craft. I did something that made me better than I was prior to. So, you know, that's, that's, that's all part of it. Um, exactly. exactly. I'm, I'm, uh, for Matthew, I'm trying to see the questions from here. And this, I'm having a hard time. It's, it's like it's really far. So I'm just What's really far. The questions, man. It's, it's like, All right. Well, when you find it, well, as you do, I'll. I'll um, someone asks us what um, life in the Olympic Village was like, and oh, that's a good question. 
claiming to be question. the handball team. I don't remember that part, but wait, the, you what? You what? She said something about claiming to be the handball team and cafeteria and the other GB athletes and stuff. Who did you did? I don't know. She has a question. I don't know, but Benny said it. So oh, oh no 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 no! I'm sorry. Obviously, my sister and her English. Um, it was what we did when we first got to the uh, <laughs> we first got to the Olympic Village. <laughs> what the hell? <laughs> what did we do when we first got to the Olympic Village? I don't remember. I don't know. I don't know what you're talking about, bro. Um, this guy. Okay, so what was the experience like in the Olympic Village? It was great. I enjoyed it. Thank you. <laughs> nah, 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 it was, uh, nah, bro. It was, it was amazing, man. Honestly, it was uh, to be around the best athletes, I think, from all over, from all over the world. It was, um, it was a great experience. Uh, I don't know what else to say. <laughs> it was, uh, it was, uh, it was fantastic. I don't you, know. You, you know what it is? You know what's funny? Like, again, nobody knew what to expect. This was our first time doing, um, doing, going to the Olympics for everybody. So it was new. I know when we got there, when we first got there, we just started walking around. And, and it's crazy because everybody knows about the weather in London and everything. But um, let's see what Matthew wrote. Uh, I don't, I don't want to read it. Just, just nah, no, no. Uh, so, um, so it's crazy. The day the Olympics started to the day it ended, the weather was impeccable in um in london i'm talking it was sunny and hot every single day i don't think london has had two weeks like that since and we get there and i remember just being like oh let's just go walking and we were just walking around meeting the athletes and saying hello and being upstanding gentlemen as we are and um uh we get to the cafeteria and literally it's every cuisine you can think of from pretty much every country represented in the um, in Olympics. They had they had British food, they had West Caribbean food, they had African food. Um, they 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 didn't have Nigerian jollof though. That wasn't allowed into the Olympic Village. Um, but we uh, we would just go there and eat, and it was interesting because these are the best athletes on the planet, the best athletes on the planet, all in the same place uh at one time and we um i remember the usa team comes in and some of these athletes have regular jobs during the three four year period when they're prepared for um for the olympics so when lebron uh and and kobe walk into the cafeteria they just go ballistic and just start surrounding them this is why guys like that weren't able to stay in, in the village yeah. so we're seeing that how everybody responds to them and everything, and it's crazy. But then Usain Bolt walks in, and this is when I realized he was the biggest athlete on the planet. When he walked into the cafeteria, there was not a sight, a, a person in the room who wasn't trying to surround him or get his attention. That's how big. I'm talking the USA had the best athletes on the planet, the best NBA players, and these celebrities on their team, and Usain Bolt was the one that attracted the most attention. Like, that's how big he was. And I remember we got to... Serena, yeah. Serena was cool. Serena was, Serena was cool. cool. She, she was, was she was. She no, out. Michael she Phelps, was too. We, was, we used to walk with Michael Phelps to the, uh, to the cafeteria, and the dude would never smile. And we, we, we're, sitting, we're literally sitting there next to him, and we talk to him, and he's like, you have to understand, for the last, like, 15 years, He's had to wake up at 5 a.m. every single day to swim, to work out, and prepare. And somebody asked the question, what the greats do to be great, that's what they do. For, for Michael Phelps to be who he is, who he is or was or whatever, he had to do that. And people was like, well, it must be great to be, to be heralded as one of the greatest Olympians ever. But the sacrifice that comes along with it is it's so dear that he probably feels like he's missed out on a lot of his life. But we have enjoyed what he's done. It's like, like people say, the Mamba mentality. That thing wasn't, it wasn't a thing until Kobe put it out there. And people would always have their, their stories about how Kobe's approach to the game and everything he did and like his work ethic. And like, you can't really, you're not born with that. You, you know, I'm, I'm sorry, you can't just acquire that. Those are the type of things that you have to really 
be um, mold over time and essentially be born with because like you said, his gift was his curse. His, his gift to his craft and his discipline to the game probably cursed him in other ways when in regards to his interaction with his teammates or whatever. But it's what made him be great. And it's what made Michael Phelps be great too. So that's, it's what, funny. that's what I got from just being around him in the Olympics. Yeah, no, it's, it's funny you said that because I'm sorry if I don't remember the person's name, but I was using my, you know, new developed skills where I'm paying attention and looking, but also reading the notes at the same time, which I'm really getting really good at. But it's, it's the questions kind of related to what you said. Someone asked, you know, can you talk a little bit about some of the sacrifices you had to make in order to gain in other aspects? So basically what you were just talking about, about Mike Phelps, what, what are some of the things that you sacrificed, uh, you know, in order to, to get to the level that you got to? Um, you know, whether, and again, uh, when I say this, I mean not just in basketball, you know what I mean? I mean just in general, even now that you're a GM and whether it's business in Africa or whatever, what are some of the things that you constantly have to sacrifice in order to achieve that? You can go first. Really? Yeah. I just I just read the whole, like I just did, just look at this for a second. You, you were talking, I was listening, paying attention while Right, I they, just finished talking, so let's break it yeah, up a little bit. So yeah, but I did, no, no, but look, but I was making an effort where I'm improving my skills, basically sacrificing my uh, relax, relax, what's, what's the word am I looking for? Exactly. <laughs> exactly. So I'm sacrificing, listen, I'm sacrificing not being uh, just relaxed, I'm being tense, right? And I'm reading the comments and the questions as you're speaking, so I prepare us for the next jump in. So after I finish all that and explain it, you tell me to go first. So during all that, you can't. Um, it was out TJ. It was TJ that asked the question. Okay, okay, I got you. I got you. Uh, TJ, who? Which TJ? Oh, boy. Huh? Which TJ? I got to look for it again. She's here somewhere. It's a she. Yes. Oh. Anyway. All right. So uh, to answer that question since Pops doesn't want to go first. Um, I'll answer the question, right? So anyway, yeah, the sacrifices. Not to take away, by the way, that was a great question about the Olympic uh, part, uh, great question. But honestly, I, I can't see success without sacrifice. And, you know, the sacrifice is going to come differently to everyone. I think that you know, you can't do everything that you want to do and, and stay focused on what you want to achieve. You know, for example, I, I always go back to, you know, when I made the commitment that I want to make it to the NBA, I want to be great. I made a commitment to get up at six every day. Um, you know, as, as you get older and especially now, it's, it's a lot harder because you're so distracted with so many other things. But to me, back then, it's the only thing that I wanted, and I was willing to, to sacrifice a lot for it. You know, leaving the UK and coming to high school in the US at 14, that's a sacrifice where, you know, all of a sudden leaving your family behind, you're leaving your friends behind, and you're starting brand new because you're trusting, you know, mm -hmm. your mission and your goal. You know, uh, making sure, you know, there was a time even when I was in the NBA, and I think I told you this story, Pops, in the summer where I wanted it so bad, I made sure that I was taking, I was making 800 shots every day. Um, it, I didn't care how long it took me, but I had to make 800 shots every day for the whole summer. And, you know, that took, you know, a lot of sacrifice to commit to, to being in the gym and, you know, not doing what everyone else is doing, whether it's just hanging out or because I had a goal to get to, you know. So I think everyone's sacrifices will come differently, but you just have to be honest with yourself in, what are you sacrificing and is this something that's going to hold you back because if it's not then you could just keep on doing it but if it affects what you're trying to be or where you're trying to get to then you know the the main thing is where you want to get to so it's got to go you know except if it's bigger than what you really want yeah man that's 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 so true and i remember i spoke to I spoke about it before like one season i gave up you know alcohol i gave up any any type of beverage. which season which season was that <laughs> <laughs> i've known this guy for so long i want to know which season it was 
it, we never we weren't teammates during the regular season. So it was um, it was the summer. It was the season I played in Turkey. <laughs> the the no, no, no. It definitely wasn't the summer. Definitely wasn't the summer. <laughs> oh, okay. It was the season I played in Turkey. It was one of the best seasons I had. But it was the season leading up to the Olympics. So obviously that went out the window when I ran into you again because you're a bad influence. But um, I don't know what you're talking about. Of course I don't, you don't. Um, nah, so I don't even. He said it was high school. It was uh, so. It was when I played in Turkey. Shout out to my boy Stephen Berthier. They they came. My boys from London came and used to watch me. Used to come and watch me play out there. And I never touched alcohol that whole season. It was the first time I had ever done it. And I only drank water or I only drank um, juice that I made. Like I said, and it was a sacrifice because you know you want to have a social life. And my boys were coming from London, so we would hang out and 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 kick it. But I wasn't drinking. And I, and I felt like I couldn't have fun with them. But when I played, it showed. It showed my discipline. It showed my sacrifice. It showed in, I remember, um, it's funny that I did get suspended for doping, but I had a teammate who played with me before and was like, yes, it was Besiktas. Yeah, Matthew was there too. Um, I had a teammate who played with me before that was like, yo, why does it seem like you're jumping higher than you were before? And I was like, I don't know. I'm just taking care of my body a little better. I'm lifting. I'm, you know, I'm putting the right things into my body. And yes, it was a sacrifice, but I knew I had to be in the best shape of my life going into the Olympics. And so sacrifice is is all based on what you want to get out of it. Like, it's, it's, I wouldn't consider those things sacrifices if you know on the other end, um, on the other side of it, it's going to come success. So it's all about what your why is and all about what um, what it is you want to accomplish. Perfect. All right. Last question because it's 53, but that qu the, the last question got to come from you because I put in a lot of effort in the last question. I, I, I uh, okay, so we might have to do some quick fire rounds. Uh, somebody asked me where I got this hoodie. It's just like the Africa sweater I had on the other day. It was from the Players Association and their campaign with the NBA Africa game. Um, a few years ago, and I've had it ever since then. One of my favorite hoodies, for sure. And it's got every every country, every country represent ever, ever represented in the NBA from African players. So, Pop, Pop, someone someone said someone said that we should put it up for an award. <laughs> so, someone said that there should be well, a up for an award. Yeah, they said there should be a competition if they get the questions. Right, we should uh, ship the award. I, you know, yeah. all the good, all the stuff. Look at all the men, the wild dang memory <laughs> <thing we're laughs> be giving out. That's gonna be going? amazing. I'm going they for that competition. They asked about the hoodie. Why are you saying? Oh, they want my no, no, no. I figured they was coming to you because someone mentioned your hat and everything. So <laughs> nah, don't try it. Someone said the hoodie, bro. The hoodie, bro. They won't fit them though. Why would I give them my actual hoodie? Like, how many jerseys no, do you have? No, they they said they're gonna do a question. Like, if we do a question and answer thing, if they win, we should send the hoodie. I mean, I'm open for the question and answer. Whether the price yeah, but, be this but hoodie, the huh? price they want the price to be anyway. Yo, we take it. No, nah, I have a jacket. If if man, if they really want to do that, I have the exact same thing in the jacket form that I would. Uh, oh, you're gonna, gonna give away? You want me to get it? You want me to grab it and show? No, it? no, no. But you're gonna give away that jacket? Have you seen? You have no, it? no, 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 no. It's all right. We wear it next time. Wear it next it time. It doesn't fit me. <laughs> That's why I'm giving it away. <laughs> <laughs> Yo, this guy, man. Hey, send it, send it, nah, man. Send it to somebody. Um, mm -hmm. Nah, but is that is that all the questions? We got five minutes. Well, somebody wanted to, us to talk about the game by game experience, but that's way more than five minutes. Um, what's it called? So, I guess we can just do shout outs and you know say uh, say what's going on for next time. Even though I don't think we really finished this episode, but it was a good one. Another two hours. Another. Um, engaging episode i still feel like um yeah we spoke about it but now it's time for action when it comes to uh the british basketball scene and again um you know i, I know i haven't done a camp or anything there but that kind of stuff is coming i'm probably going to end up teaming up with a while because he's got something great in place um and you know because it's, it's not only yes i'm focusing on africa i know a lot of people feel like why don't i do stuff in the uk um, if, if I'm being brutally honest, um, I just didn't think, um, 
you know, uh, again, this is coming from a personal uh, place. So, again, I always wanted to have a, a, a great career in the NBA, play 10, 15 years and do all this great stuff. But I just felt like I wasn't big enough. I felt like I didn't have um, enough of an impact on the game to to be able to inspire a generation. So I always would just be like, whatever Lou does, I'd, I'd help him with it. I just don't know if, because um, I felt like I failed to an extent, which is why I'm, I work so hard on this side of the game to help these young, this younger generation, because I felt like on the court, I wasn't, I didn't achieve what I wanted to personally achieve. So moving forward, move, see, that's why Kieran can't be in this chat. Now that you'll forget Kieran, because we got three minutes. Kieran is this. Oh yeah, and sorry, if seems we got three minutes, I totally forgot. So, um, anybody want to see Luau have a cameo? Uh, my documentary, Shameless Plug. My my documentary is coming coming out on Thursday, um, and Lou Lou and Big Bro make a feature uh, appearance. Um, it's pretty much my um, chronicling my life through high school and GW all the way to the Hall of Fame. So Thursday, um, yeah. and the link is in my bio. You can check it out. Um, I actually have to do a couple of the lives, no mercy conversations that I'm having leading up to it. Me and Luau talk every day, so we won't be doing another one. But I'm doing a conversation with um, a good friend, Bosnum and St. John, in regards to her life and how she approached life with no mercy. And just leading up to the, the premiere and the promotion of the of the documentary we're going to be doing a, a bunch of interesting things leading up to it so if you guys can check it out and and go from there again if you don't want to hear a guy from south london then don't watch it but luau is definitely going to be speaking on it too yes you can watch in the uk it's going to be on facebook but the link is in my bio too bro i encourage everyone to watch it please it's dope i can't wait for it pops um you know the whole story um get get really to check it out you get to know pops better um you know uh the guy is now called the uh, gold killer i mean the well killer by, <laughs> by, by, by luck but um no seriously uh shout out to everyone for checking it out i want people to know too we're we're progressing uh, there's a lot that we're really going to talk about i know it was gb today mm -hmm. but i really want to talk to people about just the stuff that we're doing off the court business wise the stuff that we're doing with basketball Mm -hmm. uh, in Africa, the the opportunities there, what uh, BOW is, Basketball Africa League, what other opportunities that's going to open. Also, when BOW comes back, BOW is like every two weeks in a different country. And it's from like Thursdays to Sundays. So it's going to be like an all-star weekend where people could travel there. There's going to be summits, meetings held. It's not just a game, you know. It's mm -hmm. just Africans coming together and working together to see what we could do in just that country, but also all over Africa. So bear with us, stay with us. Uh, this is not just about basketball. It's more than basketball. And as we move forward, we'll talk about a lot more other stuff. Uh, but make sure you check out that uh, the Pops documentary on Thursday, right? On Thursday at 7, 7 p.m. Thursday at 7 p.m. All right. Uh, Eastern time. Oh, yeah. And uh, the hoodie. Uh, we're going to put up some questions for that Pops hoodie. Uh, it's uh, you're, you're breaking up. What? I think you went on mute again. I can't. It's you. it's medium size or is it small? Um... <laughs> yeah. So we're gonna put up questions for that hoodie. So stay with us if you want that hoodie. Uh, Hello. Oh, all right. Well, there you go. Huh? Hi, pops. No, uh, no, no, all nothing. Right. I was just saying that you know you you did great today. Uh, see you next time. All right, bro. All right, yo. all right, everyone. All right, fella. All right. Take care. Take care.